Hello, my name is Henry Silverman, and in this presentation, I would like to discuss the right to refuse medical treatment. Is there a right to refuse medical treatments? Much of our modern political morality is influenced by the philosopher John Stuart Mill, who was a champion of individual freedom of choice. In his most influential writing on liberty, he writes that over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. In order to understand who has the right to refuse life-sustaining treatments and who has the right to die, one needs to start with John Stuart Mill, because it is this principle of autonomy that forms the legal and moral basis for these rights. In the 1950s and 1960s, ventilators and dialysis machines enabled in individuals to live longer. All these new treatments raise the issue as to whether patients can refuse treatments. Personal autonomy was the defining principle, and phrases such as death with dignity, right to die, choice in dying, and compassion in dying framed the debate. However, the recent experiences with euthanasia and eugenics in the 1930s and 1940s were raised as concerns. Furthermore, many were influenced by the writings in the Hippocratic Oath, which included, neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so. Also, into whatsoever houses I enter, I will enter to help the sick, and I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm. But how does one define harm? As is often the case, it took the legal system to give authority to the moral arguments. As such, it is instructive to review the landmark legal cases involving the right to refuse medical treatments. And these cases include the Karen Ann Quinlan case in 1975, the Nancy Cruzan case in 1990, and the Terry Schreiber case in 2005. Regarding the Quinlan case, in 1975, 21-year-old Karen Ann Quinlan was in a persistent vegetative state caused by her taking a mixture of drugs and alcohol. She required ventilatory support, and doctors gave her little hope that she would ever regain consciousness. Eventually, the parents asked the court for permission to remove her from the ventilator. This action, however, was opposed by physicians and backed by the state attorney general. The New Jersey Supreme Court ruled that a person has the right to refuse medical treatment and one does not lose that right when incompetent. This right can't be exercised by a legally authorized individual. The New Jersey Supreme Court added the following arguments in favor of such a right. The state's interest in the preservation of life weakens and the individual's right of privacy grows as the degree of bodily invasion increases and the prognosis dims. Ultimately, there comes a point at which the individual rights overcome the state's interests. The Nancy Cruzon case occurred in 1990. In 1983, Nancy Beth Cruzon was involved in an auto accident which left her in a persistent vegetative state. She required artificial nutrition and hydration, but not a ventilator. In 1988, Cruzon's parents requested to terminate the tube feedings but the state hospital officials refused to do so without court approval. The Missouri Supreme Court ruled in, in favor of the state's policy requiring clear and convincing evidence of previous wishes to terminate the tube feedings in order to grant Cruzon's right to refuse treatment. This case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in 1990, the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed a competent person's right to refuse any life-sustaining treatment and for incapacitated persons. However, it left it to the states the issue of determining the legal standard of substituted judgment, which can include clear and convincing evidence of previous wishes. In August 1990, Cruzan's parents filed a court petition for a new hearing as three of Nancy's friends came forward to assert that Nancy had expressed that she would never have wanted to live like a vegetable maintained by two feedings. The Missouri court agreed to the petition, the two feedings were terminated, and Nancy Cruzan died two weeks later. 
Was the Cruzon case a right to die case? Not really. Rather, it was a right to choose or a right to refuse. And more specifically, it involved what should be the standards by which to judge the evidence of what the patient would have wanted. Pushed to act by the public's reaction to Cruzan and the requirement of clear and convincing evidence, Congress and the President decreed the Patient Self-Determination Act. This act required all hospitals, nursing homes, and health maintenance organization to provide all adult patients written information describing the patient's right to make decisions about medical care, including the right to execute a living will or a durable power of attorney. We will return to the issue of advanced planning in just a few minutes, but let's review one more case. This would be the Terry Shriver case of 2005. In 1990, Terry Shriver was a 27-year-old who suffered a cardiac arrest with subsequent anoxic brain injury, which left her in a persistent vegetative state. Her husband, the legal guardian, petitioned the Florida court to remove the feeding tube. Terry's parents, however, opposed removing the feeding tube, claiming that Terry was still conscious. The court determined that Terry would not have wished to continue life-prolonging measures. However, the executive and legislative branches in Florida intervened to halt the process. After appeals, the federal court system upheld the original decision to remove the feeding tube, and hence the feeding tube was removed, and Terry died two weeks later. The Terry Shriver case upheld the right of the legal guardian to act on a substituted judgment standard to request the right for an incompetent patient to refuse life-sustaining treatments. But this case also affirmed an emerging clinical and legal position that enteral and parenteral nutrition and hydration is analogous to other more sophisticated medical interventions such as the ventilator that may be withheld or withdrawn according to general principles. Who opposes such a right to withhold and withdraw treatments and why? This would include advocacy groups for persons with disabilities, right to life groups, and some religious groups and organizations. So let's review the federal initiatives affecting end-of-life decision-making. As we saw in 1990, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the right to self-determination, including patients no longer able to direct their own care, stating that decisions for incompetent pa pa persons should be based on previously stated wishes. And then we have the federal law in 1991, the Patient Self-Determination Act, which requires that patients be informed of their rights to accept or refuse treatments and to specify care decisions in advance of possible incapacity. So let's talk now about the role of advanced care planning. There are two vehicles or two types of advanced directives to ensure such a right to refuse. First, there is the living will which is an instructional document that describes the types of treatments an individual desires in certain situations, such as ventilation, nutrition. It follows an if-and-then model. For example, if I lose capacity and I'm in a certain specified condition, then I don't want any CPR, ventilator, feeding tubes, etc. Or the person may request aggressive interventions in the previous specified condition. The durable power of attorney for health care designates a spokesperson for the patient when he or she is unable to make or communicate medical decisions for themselves. There are certain advantages attached to the living will. One, it allows specific documentation of treatments desired in specific situation. It does establish clear and convincing evidence of patient's wishes and can be easily changed by the patient over time. It does have certain limitations. First, it does not include the naming of a surrogate decision maker. It does not provide guidance for unanticipated situations and can be restricted by the medical conditions in which the patient has. For example, persistent vegetative state, terminally ill. There are certain advantages to the durable power of attorney for health care or a health care proxy designation. One, a health care proxy can make real-time decisions and can cover all unanticipated decisions 
that are not included in a living will. There are certain limitations. One, it requires frank and detailed discussions between the patient and the appointed agent. Two, some individuals may not have access to someone close enough to serve this function. And then, the chosen agent may often lack the strength and fortitude to carry out the specified decisions to forego life-sustaining treatments. As discussed, the previous cases represented a right to refuse medical treatments. At this point, it is useful to discuss a right to die, which would include euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. So what is euthanasia? Well, it means a good death. Euthanasia is the painless killing of a patient suffering from an incurable and painful disease. It involves a deliberate, intentional taking of a life of a hopeless person. While passive euthanasia is accepted, active euthanasia is proscribed as a violation of the moral code and professional ethics of physicians. Is there a distinction between killing and letting die? Active euthanasia, as mentioned previously, involves killing. For example, administering a lethal dose to a patient. In contrast, passive euthanasia involves letting die, for example, withholding or withdrawing a respirator from a patient. Euthanasia is actually legal in the Netherlands and Belgium. So is there a moral difference between killing and letting die? The philosopher James Rachel thinks sometimes it would be better to kill a patient rather than merely let the patient die. What's the argument for this? Well, let's review one example. Consider a cancer patient in the process of dying, but still days from the end. His pain is not controlled, and he and the family ask the doctor to end his pain, even if it means dying sooner. If passive euthanasia is allowed, the doctor can withhold any treatments that are extending the patient's life, and thus end his suffering a little sooner, saving the patient from a day of pain. But if active euthanasia is allowed, the doctor can give a lethal injection now, saving several more days of pain. Surely, active euthanasia would be better here. Hence, James Ratios does make a compelling argument that maintains that any distinction between killing and letting die is not morally significant. It may be the case that actual cases of killing are usually moral reprehensible, for example, murders, and cases of letting die, that is, passive euthanasia, usually are not. But the distinction regarding the acts themselves are not morally significant, and it is other factors, for example, motive and intention, that should be the focus of our moral assessment. However, there are several objections that could be raised against active euthanasia. First, the practice of medicine would be in jeopardy as a moral profession. One cannot have doctors as killers as well as healers. It will undermine trust. Second, there are limits to respecting autonomy. We do draw the line in other cases. For example, refusing to provide elective amputation for persons suffering from so-called bodily integrity identity disorder. Third, allowing active euthanasia may pave a slippery slope to involuntary euthanasia, where euthanasia is performed on incompetent patients. Finally, there may be a risk of abuse for vulnerable patients, such as disabled patients, who might be persuaded or manipulated into believing that there is a duty to die. Finally, let's discuss the practice of physician-assisted suicide. So what is physician-assisted suicide? Upon the request of the patient, the physician provides the means or information necessary on how to end one's life. Physicians do not participate in the action of ending the patient's life. If they did, it would be considered active euthanasia. Currently, physician-assisted suicide exists in five states, California, Montana, Oregon, Vermont, and the state of Washington. So why is physician-assisted suicide readily more legal but not voluntary active euthanasia? Well, first, the risk of abuse is less 
and physician assisted suicide, as the final act is solely the patient's. And hence, the risk of subtle coercion from doctors, family members, institutions, or other social forces is greatly reduced. But there are some patients who cannot swallow or move, and hence will be unable to initiate physician-assisted suicide. This, however, is thought to be less than ideal, but necessary in light of the risk of abuse with active euthanasia. There are, however, arguments for and against physician-assisted suicide. Regarding arguments for physician-assisted suicide, a patient should have the right to die to end great suffering. People will still commit suicide if they are desperate, and hence it is better that such an act is under the auspices of the health care provider. Finally, financial strain on families with terminal patients will be reduced. There are arguments against physician-assisted suicide. First, people will begin to request physician-assisted suicide on the basis of depression alone. With current palliative care methods, we should be able to reduce a person's suffering without death. And finally, physician-assisted suicide violates the principle, first, do no harm. Those who advocate for physician-assisted suicide say that there are adequate safeguards to prevent abuse. These safeguards include the presence of an incurable condition, the patient cannot be depressed, the patient needs to be 18 years or older, there needs to be consultation with two physicians who have determined that the patient has no more than six months to live, and the patient has to make three separate requests, two oral and one written. The Netherlands, in which physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia is legal, have a similar set of safeguards, which is shown in this slide. However, there are several documents explaining why safeguards do not work. In one document, maintain that there is an illusion of safeguards and controls with euthanasia or assisted suicide. This document states, in 30 years, the Netherlands has moved from euthanasia of people who are terminally ill to euthanasia of those who are chronically ill, from euthanasia for physical illness to euthanasia for mental illnesses, from euthanasia for mental illnesses to euthanasia for psychological distress or mental suffering, and now euthanasia simply if a person is over the age of 70 and is tired of living. So in summary, so in summary, a right to die involving euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide remains controversial. However, a right to refuse medical treatments is less controversial. Thank you very much.